صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ومولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة سيدي يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما سلام الله سلام ملائكته المقربين. These are the words of Imam Salih عليه السلام. His salutation, his uncle of the Abbas. سلام الله وسلام ملائكته المقربين وأنبياء. والزاكيات الطيبات فيما تغتدي عليك وتروح يا ابن أمير المؤمنين رحمة الله وبركاته إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون The sky of Karbala is replete with stars that are so bright that are almost blinding. This is what prompted Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam on the eve of Ashura to say that my companions are the most loyal and the best companions in history. But one star outshines all the other stars. His name is Abbas. Imam al-Sadiq says that he has a position in paradise that all the martyrs and there is nothing above martyrdom. He has a position in paradise that all the martyrs on the Day of Judgment will wish if they were in his position. Abel Fadl has many virtues. And one of the tragedies is that we only have 10 days to speak about these personalities. Otherwise, we could spend 1,000 days talking about one of his virtues. He was courageous and brave. He was loyal. He exhibited empathy on the day of Ashura. Drinking from the water wouldn't have made any difference. But he wanted to experience what his brother Imam Hussein was experiencing. And he wanted to die while he was thirsty, just like Imam Al Hussein. Alayhi salam. And tonight I will be shedding light on two of his qualities two is of his virtues. The first virtue is his inner eye. Imam al-Sadiq in his salutation when he visits Imam al-Sadiq. Imam al-Sadiq visits Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Imagine an infallible Imam visiting Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and recites 
a ziyarah for him. He says to him, that ashhadu annak, I testify that you had an inner eye. And Imam al-Sajjad says that my uncle Abil Fadl al-Abbas had insight that permeated through all the aspects of his life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this concept in the Quran in many verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endowed us with the ability to see. And through our eyes, we navigate our way through life. But the heart has the ability to see as well. Now, if you were blind, you would trip over everything. You would always fall in every pit. But when your inner eye becomes blind, you would sink in the abyss of falsehood and in the abyss of sin. Now, with the inner eye, you would be able to see the reality of things, the true nature of things, things beyond the surface. Because in this life, according to the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that people only see the facade of this world. They don't see the reality of things. Imam Sadiq was once asked, Ya ibn Rasulullah, you're infallible, right? Does that mean you're coerced into not committing any sins, and into abstaining from sins? Or that simply you don't have the desire to commit any sin? The Imam said, no. We see the reality of things. And he pointed to a pile of worm-infested, rotten meat. He said to the guy, would you eat that? The man said, I would never think about eating it. The Imam said, and we never think about committing sins. Why? Because they're able to see the true nature of sin. Let me give you an example. We all have inner eyes, but we need to nurture it. We need to pour water on it for it to grow so that we could see everything clearly as Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was able to see things and see the future ahead of him. We all know that hurting an orphan is bad. It's ugly. How do we know? Through our inner eye. Now, we all know that, for example, pedophilia is also ugly and bad. But there are people who are blind, people that practice pedophilia and think that it's right. They don't see it as a sin, as an ugly thing. Incest is by all means repulsive, but there are people that practice it and think it's okay. These people are blind. <coughs> Yusuf is a good example. He was cornered, he was in a room, he was young, he was only 16 years old, and he had the tools, he had the desire, he had the appetite, according to our narrations, and according to the verse in the Quran. And Zulaykha was the most beautiful queen. She said to him, Yusuf, look at me, let's commit the sin. We're alone in the room. He said, Ma'adallah. He could see what she couldn't. Innahu Rabbi Ahsana Mathwai. After all the good that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done to me, I commit the sin. Then he says, Innahu la yuflihu al-dhalimun. The people that commit sin will not succeed in life. How? He could see these things through his inner. One day the Prophet was in the cemetery with his companions. He said to his companions that I could see two of the graves, two people that are buried in these graves, they are wailing. They are being chastised and punished. They said, Ya Rasulullah, how come we can't hear? We can't see anything. He said, because your hearts have become like a playground for Satan. And this is why you can't hear, you can't see. When you purify your heart, 
you will be able to, th to see things clearly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the ability, the capacity to, th to see things beyond the surface. The Prophet says that if you slander someone behind his back, a scent, a foul smell will be produced that will irritate all the angels in the seven heavens. In the seven heavens. One day, one of his wives, she made fun of another wife, Sauda, because she was short. She whispered in the ears of another woman saying, look how short she is. What was the Prophet's response? He said to her that you said a word, you uttered words that if mixed with the ocean, it will make the ocean stink. <laughs> but how does the inner eye work? Let me give you an example that we can relate to. Someone that has a shallow understanding of, of health and food. Doesn't have an understanding of his health system and the benefits and harms of food. When he's hungry, if he sees food, he would want to eat it. But a person with a deeper understanding of his health and the harms and benefits of food will only eat from the food that benefits him and will refrain from anything that could possibly harm him. If you're diabetic, you wouldn't eat something that would harm you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this, this concept in the Quran. Initially, we have three groups of people with relation to their relationship with shaitan. Some people, they inadvertently, by accident, bump into the shaitan every now and then. And I'll get to that. And some people, they form a friendship with shaitan. Every week they smoke shisha together. Every, mo every week they do something together. And some people, they're partners with, with shaitan. They share their thoughts with shaitan, they share food with shaitan, and shaitan is also their partner in their children. And that's mentioned in the Quran. Sharikum fil amwal, you become a partner in their wealth and in making children. That's why we have guidance, guidelines with respect to the intimate moments as well in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says with respect to the first group, فَإِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ when shaitan tries to, to lure them, when, when, the, when the desires are provoked. Once, John the Baptist, Prophet Yahya, he meets with the shaitan. So Yahya says to him, could you give me a word of advice? He said, yes. One of the things that I do is that when a human being becomes full, if he eats food until he's satisfied, then his intellect, will not function properly, while his desires will become active. That's when I whisper in his ears. Yahya said, I make a vow. I vow not to ever become full, not to ever become satisfied with food. Shaitan then says to him, and I vow not to give a sincere advice to humans ever again. When Shaitan whispers in their ears, Shaitan, he leans on the, our interior as well, our desires. So it's from the outside and from the inside, we're intoxicated. And then the Allah, all of a sudden, they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want to commit this sin. They sober up. All of a sudden, they can now see things clearly. They have, a, they have a full view of life and a full understanding of the repercussion of sin. Let me tell you how it works. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the famous Umayyad Caliph, he wanted to change a very dangerous tradition. Muawiyah was the first to curse Amir al-Mu'mineen on the pulpit before and after every ser ser sermon. 
And he made it a law, he enacted a law, asking all the speakers to curse Imam Ali alayhi salam before and after every time. And that's mentioned in Sahih Muslim as well. That's mentioned in Sahih Muslim. For 60 years, on 80,000 pulpits, Amir al-Mu'mineen was cursed. To an extent that they even built a mosque, naming it Masjid al Ali. The mosque was named after the cursing of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And the story behind it was one day Muawiyah, after he finished his, his uh, Friday khutbah, he came out of the mosque, he was approached by a man from Sham, he said to him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, as they used to call him, you forgot to curse Ali ibn Abi Talib before and after the sermon. He said, did I? He said, yes. He said, bring the pulpit. They brought the pulpit in the middle of the road. He went on the pulpit and he cursed Amir al-Mu'mineen. Then they built a mosque calling it Mas Masjid al-Sabbi Ali. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz for a reason. He was also an oppressor. And he is cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to our narrations. He wanted to change that. But he couldn't. It was very difficult. Because people were used to it. So one day he meets with a Christian man. He says to him that tomorrow I want you to come to the palace. In the assembly. And you propose to marry my daughter. He said, I want to marry your daughter. He said, I don't want to give you my daughter. But this is just a show. And then you talk to me, and I talk, he taught him what to say. So tomorrow, the Christian man comes in front of everyone. He says, Amir, I propose to marry your daughter. Everyone was there, said, you're a Christian man. You're an unbeliever. You can't permanently marry my daughter. <clears throat> so he said, if that's the case, then why did Ali ibn Abi Talib marry <coughs> Fatima al-Zahra, the daughter of the Prophet? <coughs> they said, oh come on, Ali ibn Abi Talib was the first to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was the first to pray. Sallaytu qabla al-nas bi awam. I prayed before everyone else, seven years before everyone else. That's when he started praying. So he said, if that's the case, then why do you curse him? They didn't have an answer. He illuminated their hearts with these words. Just few words, but he illuminated their hearts. Now we need to activate our inner eye with respect to everything in life. <coughs> Especially our aqaid, our beliefs. Our aqaids and beliefs need to be substantiated. They need to be backed with concrete evidence. We need an inner eye to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because once, when we pray, we say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I testify that there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do you testify when you don't know? When you haven't experienced it with your inner eye. That's why we see that the approach of Ahl Bayt when they spoke to, to non-believers, was by provoking the inner eye, provoking the innate nature that is called fitrah in the Qur'an. They not always resorted to sophisticated, complicated philosophical concepts. It was usually the basic things so that the hearts are enlightened. For example, one day the Imam meets with Ibn Abi al-Awja, who is an atheist. The Imam said to him, look, if after we die, we realize that there is nothing after death and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't exist. It's a win-win situation. Because we lived as you lived. We got married, you got married. You ate, we ate. But if after death we realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists and that there is a judgment day and all the evil doers will, will be held accountable for their deeds, then it's a win-lose situation. Suddenly he's alert. He's an atheist. He calls Imam Sadiq, Oh Sayyidi, you have no Rasulullah. Or for example, they always used to use this example. That when you're in need and there's no one, absolutely no one that can help you, your heart will cling, will cling to something. You'll have hope in something. Imagine yourself in the middle of the sea. Imagine yourself in an ICU unit and the doctors have said there's absolutely no hope in your recovery and you're dying. 
your heart with, will cling to something. And Bayt say that this something is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we cherish this, mo this moment and we have to use this experience throughout our life. Yes, I've been through this situation. And I know how it feels. And this is why I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. This is how I have an understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. With respect to our belief in the Imams, you see that some people were, were blind. They didn't have an inner eye. While some people were very alert. They could see everything. They, they, they understood everything. For example, People used to come to Imam Ali alayhi salam in the battle of Jamal and they would tell him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, it's very confusing because on the one hand you have the Prophet's wife and you have Talha and Zubair, on the other hand, on the other side you have the first general in Islam, the first person to believe in God, the brother of Rasulullah. The Imam said to him that what you lack is the inner eye you don't have insight. You should know truth to be able to, to know who is following the truth. And some people joined Imam Ali alayhi salam only because the likes of Ammar and Uwais were with him. And the majority of Sunnis today, they believe that Muawiyah was wrong because of Ammar. Ammar was killed and they narrate a hadith by the Prophet that states Ammar will be killed by the group of the transgressors. Now, we have tens of traditions that say Amir al Mu'min is always with the truth. They don't accept that. But because of Ammar, they say that Amir al Mu'min was rightful and that his enemies were not in his, in his battle with, with Muawiyah. On the other hand, you had people that had an insight that permeated in their all their aspects in, in their lives. People like Hajj ibn Ali. He came to visit Imam Ali on the 21st of the month of Ramadan. On the day Imam Ali departed this world, the Imam said to him, Ya Hajj, what will you do if you were asked to basically disassociate yourself from me? What will you do? He said, Ya Amir al Mu'mini, I am willing to be severed in pieces and not disassociate myself from you. And years later, they dug his grave and they killed all his companions. All he was asked to do is condemn Amir al Mu'mini, curse Amir al Mu'mini. He said, I won't do that. They said, Should we kill you first or your son? He said, if you kill me first, maybe my son will, will change his mind. Kill my son first. His son was first killed, then he was killed. For Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. A man said to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, if you ask me to charge at a, at a mountain with my sword, I do it. Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, I'm going to stay with you until I'm killed. His brother was killed in the battle. Now the brother wants to join. He wants to go to the battlefield. The Imam said to him, your brother was killed just moments ago. He said, Ya Amir al mumineen I want to get killed as well. And I ask you not to wash my, my body. Leave, with, leave me with, with the blood on my, on my body so that this will testify for me on the Day of Judgment that I fulfilled my duty towards you, O Amir al mumineen this is a duty that I had to fulfill towards you. Abil Fadl Abbas was nafid al basira To an extent that although they were besieged, all the enemies surrounded them, but he was as if he could see the future, as if he could see the millions of people visiting the shrine of Imam al Hussein He could see the future. This is how much Iman he had, and this is how much insight he had. The second quality is his sense of responsibility. Brothers and sisters, we as human beings are responsible for what goes on around us. Animals are not responsible because they lack the ability to think and to sympathize 
with others. They follow their instinct. That's why you don't blame them if an animal attacks another animal. But for us, it's different. The first responsibility that we have is towards our religion. Abil Fadl Abbas, while he was fighting, in the poem that he recited, he said, The reason why I'm fighting is because of my religion. To defend my religion. And civilized nations are nations that protect their law. They don't break the law themselves, and they don't allow anyone to break the law. A friend of mine who lives in Switzerland said that in Switzerland, it's very, very, very difficult to work in the black market. Why? He said, for example, you work as a taxi driver and you don't have a license. The first person that will, the first passenger that will realize you don't have a license will report that to the police. Our responsibility towards our religion is to be firm, practice our religion, and do not allow anyone to break the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tilka Allah. These are the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fala ta'taduha. Do not transgress these boundaries. Beware of transgressing them. One of our duties today, we see people speaking in the name of Islam. Like ISIS, they call themselves the Islamic State. I don't blame them because they're using religion as a tool. They want to destroy religion from within. But I blame the media outlets. I blame all these magazines that use the name to describe them. Imagine if there was a rogue terrorist group that tried to tarnish the reputation of Christianity, calling themselves the, the Christian state. Would people use that name? Or the Jewish state? Would people, would people use that name as well? Absolutely not. Because they're branding themselves as, as an Islamic caliphate, an Islamic state that applies the rules of Islam. And they go against everything Islamic by being barbaric and by killing people. Our duty is to defend this religion. Abil Fadl Abbas didn't want to see people like Yazid misusing religion, abusing authority, and tampering with religion. This cannot happen, that's why in me, Bahani, Abadan Amdeen. The second responsibility that we have is towards the Prophet and the successor of the Prophet. The one that occupies his position. The Imam of our time, and I spoke about that briefly. In the second night, our responsibility towards the Imam of our time is first of all to know him. Because Sahih al-Muslim, Sahih Muslim again says, Man mata, whoever dies without knowing the Imam of his time dies the death of, of people that used to die in the pagan era. With absolutely no understanding of Islam. And secondly, again, building a relationship with the Imam. And you can save yourself the hassle of, of investigating how he was born and all the traditions and all the history behind it by connecting with the Imam through your heart. And you'll feel the Imam's response. And this is why he's our Imam. Because he observes our every move. The Hadith says that every Thursday night and every Friday our report cards are given to the Imam. He marks our grades. And that's in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ اَعْمَلُوا Do whatever you want to do, فَسَيَرَ Allah عَمَلَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is observing وَرَسُولُهُ and his prophet وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ and the believers. Who are the believers? Am I aware of, of what you do in, in private? Are you aware of what I do in private? No. That's why we need the Ahlul Bayt to clarify by saying that this is a reference to the Imam of the time. That's why. When we do something bad, this would hurt the heart of the Imam. When we do something good, this will make the Imam joyful. Abil Fadl Abbas, again in the same poem, when he was going back to the tent, he said, Dua an Imam and Sadiq Yaqeen. And also, I am here to defend the Imam of my time. And this is why he is so great. Because the way he defended the Imam of, of his time is, is absolutely unmatched.
The third responsibility that we have is towards ourselves and towards our organs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna sam'a. You'll have to be answerable. What did you listen to? Don't say that music, big deal. The reason why people listen to music is because it's a big distraction. The reason why people listen to music is because it drugs the mind, drugs the heart. This is why people listen to music. And your eyes. You'll be held accountable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you about everything that you looked at, everything that you saw, and everything that you heard, and everything that entered inside your heart. The third responsibility is towards our children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that the worst amongst you, the losers in the, on, the day of, on the Day of Judgment, are the people that lose themselves and lose their families, their children. Our first responsibility is to teach them, to educate them. Educate them what? To recite the Qur'an, to learn the Qur'an and instill the love of Ahlul Bayt in their hearts. How? By telling them about Ahlul Bayt. I remember since the age of four, my father used to come every night before we go to sleep and he used to tell us a story or two about the Ahlul Bayt for 10 years. And then he wrote a book, Alf Qassatin wa Qassa, a thousand and one stories, mostly revolving around the Ahlul Bayt. Again, this is your duty. And your duty is to order them to pray. Muruhum salat when they reach the age of seven, you have to order them. It's not obligatory for them, but it has to become a habit. Yes, when they grow up, they will learn about the benefits of Salat and get a full understanding of Salat and other obligations, but it has to become a habit. And brothers and sisters, allow me to take this opportunity to reiterate what Sayyid Dr. Zafar was saying. Imagine Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and this is Muharram, standing in this hall and asking you for help. He made this plea on the day of Ashura. He said, Hal min nasar in yansurna? Is there anyone willing to help us? Who was he beseeching? His enemies? He needed help to fight those enemies. His words are still resonating till today. And helping Imam al Hussein manifests itself in helping the cause of Imam al Hussein. And brothers and sisters, let's face it. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years from now, we'll all be six feet under. You see this picture over there? Abu Hassan, rahmatullahi alayhi. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. Now he is in his grave. Everyone that comes to this majlis and hears the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be rewarded and a reward will be given to Abu Hassan forever. As long as this majlis, as long as these programs are running, the reward will also be given to Marhum Abu Hassan rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. So brothers and sisters, after we die, we need something. Because we will be staying in Barzakh, which is the time between death and judgment day. Who knows, it could be millions of years. We need something perpetual. We, we, we need something running, and this is the best cause, and this is an opportunity. And you heard what Sayyid Zafar said. He burdened you with a responsibility, brothers and sisters. Even if it's just a pledge, even if you don't have the money, the hadith says that the moment you make the intention, you'll get the reward. As if you donated 10,000 pounds. The moment you make the intention. Because when you make a sincere intention, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you to raise this amount and help this cause. May Allah reward you all with the barakah, with the blessing of Allah salawat. On the 9th of Muharram, Shimr ibn al may God curse him, 
He comes to the camp of Abu Abdullah. Calls out, Aina banu ukhtina, where are my nephews? Abu al Abbas is sitting with Imam al Hussein, but he's too repulsed to answer Shimr ibn al Joshi, who is a wicked man. So he called again, Where are my nephews? They didn't answer. Abu al Fadl Abbas and his brothers were remotely related to Shimr ibn al Joshi through the uncle of their mother, Umm al Bani. When he said it for the third time, Imam al Hussein said, Answer him, even though. He's a wicked man. So Abu al-Fadl Abbas goes outside to meet him. What do you want? Shema said to him that you know very well that these people will be killed soon. Hussein and all his companions. What I, what I brought to you is impunity. You could leave his camp and no one will touch you. You're not going to be killed. You're going to be spared. Abu al-Fadl Abbas said to him, First of all, you scare me of death, and I swim in death. And secondly, you're telling me that I am protected, me and my brothers. You're giving me impunity, while the grandson of Rasulullah has no impunity. May God curse you and your impunity. Get lost. Later that night, Abu al-Fadl Abbas sees his, his brothers. His brothers were orphaned at a young age. He himself was 16 when Abu al passed away. But his brothers were very young, so they were raised by Umm al banin and his sister Zayn. So he wanted to test them. He said, what do you think? We have the impunity. They said, oh Abbas, we follow you. We do what you do. He said, then tomorrow we will lay our lives for Imam al But because the news of the impunity was spread in the camp, some of the children <coughs> feared that, you know, could Abbas leave us? That's why in the middle of the night, while Abbas was protecting the tents. Before I get to that, the reason why they wanted to give impunity to Abu al Abbas was not because he was remotely related to Shem al bin but because on the 7th of Muharram, Four of Imam Hussein's companions, they were able to, to gain access to the, to the river, to the Euphrates. The companions of, of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, his soldiers, they said, you're allowed to drink from the water, but you're not allowed to fill the containers and give it to Hussein and his children. They said that we're here to fill the containers and to, to get the water to Hussein. So they filled all the containers. When they were about to go to the camp of Imam Hussein, to the tents, 4,000 soldiers besieged them. They were now surrounded by 4,000 people. Imam Hussein salam sends Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, nafsi ant. Go on the back of your horse and go and save them. So he <coughs> charges at them and he's able to save them. And they're back in the tents. That's why they thought that this is a brave man. The best thing is to separate between him and Hussein. Because Hussein is enough for us. This is another sword that belongs to Amir al Mu'minin, and we all know how brave Amir al Mu'minin was. In the middle of the night, while the women were asleep, and the companions of Imam Hussein were worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they never slept. They were praying and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they knew that tomorrow they'll be killed. While Abbas was protecting the tent, he suddenly sees a shadow. Who knows, it could be an enemy. So he follows the shadow, and to his surprise, it's a shadow of a woman. Who is it? He said. She said, I am your sister, Zain. Don't worry. He said to him, Abbas, 
I want to tell you a story. He wanted to alight from the back of his horse. He said, no, no, I want to see you on the back of your horse. She said that after our mother died, Fatima al Zahra, my father, Amir al-Mumin, our father, wanted to get married. So he asked his brother, Aqil, who was a, a man who knew about the traits of the tribes, he said to him that I want, I want to marry a woman that was uh, conceived by, by people who are brave and courageous. He said, why, oh brother, the Amir al-Mu'mini? He said, because one day my son Hussein will be alone and I want someone to be beside him, someone to help him. He said, then you're looking for Fatima al-Kilabi al mulbani then she told him the story. After finishing the story, she held on to the rein of his horse with her right hand and pointed to the tent or her, or her, with her left hand and said, Akhi Abbas, O brother Abbas, and Nisa'ak, Nisa these are also your women. And these are also your progeny. Please protect, protect us and remain with Hussein alayhi salam. And then Fadl al-Abbas knew that this was like a, a test. So he pushed him into the stirrup of the horse until it was severed. And unsheathed his sword and shook it. And said, Ukhtah Zainab, atushajjainani wa anabnu man ta'rafi? You're encouraging me while you know that I am the son of Ali? I am the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then he said, What you'll see from me tomorrow, you'll be delighted with what you'll see from me tomorrow. And on the day of Ashura, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas came several times begging Imam al-Hussein to allow him to go to the battlefield. The Imam would refuse. Until the last time he said, Akhi ya Aba Abdullah, I can't take it anymore. I can hear the children crying out, Al Atash, Al Atash, they're thirsty. Please allow me. The Imam said, If you must go, then go bring some water for the children. So he goes on the back of his horse and charges at the Euphrates. 6,000 people were guarding the river. They back away after he charges. He's on a mission. Imam al Hussein sent him. When he's in the water, imagine, three days no water. He's so thirsty. His mouth is so dry. But he doesn't see his reflection in the water. He sees the reflection of Sukkay. He sees the reflection of the children calling out al atash al atash He sees the reflection of the parched lips of Aba Abdullah. He was about to drink from the water, but he throws the water, pours the water in the, into the river, and says, Ya nafsu min ba'dil Hussein. Who? Talks to himself saying that, Who am I? I wouldn't last a day after Hussein. وَبَعْدَهُ لَا كُنْتِ أَوْ تَكُونِي I was born for Hussein. I was raised for Hussein. And I will revolve around Hussein until I die. He fills the container, gets back on his horse, and charges towards the tent. Umar ibn Sa'd calls out, Block him! For if the water reaches the tent, him and his brother will kill us, will obliterate us, will efface us from the face of earth. Look! As Abu al Abbas was heading towards the tent, an enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hides behind the tree. He strikes Abu al al Abbas with the sword on his right hand, severing it from the wrist. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas calls out, Wallah, in qata'at 
my religion and protect my Imam وعن Imam صادق اليقين He was holding the container with his right hand Now he holds it with his left hand and charges towards the tent When another man hides behind a tree and strikes up Al-Fadl abbas on his left hand severing it from his shoulders قد قطعوا ببغيهم يساري they severed my, my left hand because of their deviance فأصلهم يا رب حر النار May you test that. May you taste the chastisement of hell. But he's on a mission. He holds the container with, with his teeth when they start showering him with arrows. One arrow pierces his right eye. Another arrow pierces his left eye. He doesn't care because his only aim is to get the water to the tents for the children to quen for the children to be quenched. When an when another arrow pierces the container, so Abel Fadl al stands in the middle of the battlefield. He doesn't know what to do. He's confused because he doesn't have hands to fight with, nor does he have water to go to the tent with. He shakes his head to remove the arrows from his eyes, but he couldn't, so he tries to remove the arrows with his knees when he bends down his helmet falls off an enemy of God comes from behind and strikes him with an iron rod on his head hey wa abbasa hey wa gariba his skin was like a hedgehog he falls Ground, but he has no hands. He calls out, Akhi Aba Abdullah, come to me. Imam al Hussein, like a bold eagle, rushes towards Abel Fadl al Abbas. But Abbas has no eyes to see with. He felt that someone is approaching. He thought that it was an enemy combatant that had come to finish him off. He said to the man, I ask you in the name of whom you worship, just allow my brother to come to me. I want to say goodbye. Imam al Hussein says, I am your brother, O oh Abbah. Now my back is broken. Now I don't know what to do, O oh Abbah. When Abbas surrendered his soul, Imam al Hussein charged at the enemies, although he was very tired, tired saying, Where are you going? You have just killed my brother. Then he goes back to the tent while wiping off his tears with his eye. So Kaina comes out, Abbas. Do you know anything about my uncle Abbas? We have lost Abbas. 
راس راح الضي غملي يرفع الرايز زينب still doesn't know he goes to the tent of Abu Fadl al Abbas and removes the pillar of the tent زينب calls out وضيعتنا بعدك يا Abu Fadl what a loss it is after you have a father. Imam Al Hussein echoes the words of Zainab. Wadiyatna baghdak ya abal fawn. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. When we do du'a for our for our twelfth Imam or Savior, he compensates us, remunerates us by doing du'a for us as well. He will pray for us. So let's recite all together. دعاء الفرج بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين بسيد سورة الفاتحة تعالى والصلوات But Abbas has no eyes to see with. He felt that someone is approaching. He thought that it was an enemy combatant that had come to finish him off. He said to the man, "Uqsimu alayka bima ta'bud." I ask you in the name of whom you worship, just allow my brother to come to me. I want to say goodbye. Imam Al Hussein says, I am your brother, O oh Abbas. Now my back is broken. Now I don't know what to do, O oh Abbas. When Abbas surrendered his soul, Imam Al Hussein charged at the enemies, although he was very tired, saying, where are you going? You have just killed my brother. Then he goes back to the tent while wiping off his tears with his eye. So Kaina comes out. Do you know anything about my uncle Abbas? We have lost Abbas. Zainab still doesn't know. He goes to the tent of Abu Fadl al Abbas and removes the pillar of the tent. Zainab 
كوزات وضيعتنا بعدك يا ابا الفضل What a loss it is after you have a father. Imam Al Hussein echoes the words of Zainab. وَضَيَعَتْنَا بَعْدَكَ يَا أَبَا الْفَوْلِ لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيِّ الْعَظِيمِ When we do dua for our for our twelfth Imam, our Savior, <clears throat> he compensates us, renewrates us by doing dua for us as well. He will pray for us. So let's recite all together. <clears throat> dua al faraj Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma kulli waliyaka al-Hujjat ibn al-Hasan. Salawatuka alayhi wa ala Recite Surah Al Fatiha after Allah Salawat.